Hello and welcome to Need to Know. I'm Ross Coulthart down here in sunny Australia on the cusp of summer and across in Los Angeles. What passes for autumn over your way, Bryce Zabel? Well, it's a little cooler today, but we're still having some pretty warm temperatures. Uh, upper 80s into the 90s. It's It's been nice. And they say we're going to have uh, rain this winter. So we're pretty rain, happy with that. Rain in Los Angeles. Yeah. Now, that's a rarity. Well, we, had, we had good rain last year and, and we look like we're going to have it again. By the way, it is good to be back. It's nice to see you again, Ross. And I have to say, the people who have been complaining, why can't you guys get some good cameras on each other, are going to be very happy with you today. Because, man, that new camera you got is a winner. Keep it up. Well, I, I, if I could endorse a camera manufacturer, I would, but I had to pay for it with my hard-earned coin. So bugger yeah. them. I'm not going to mention them. No, I don't um, get any PR here. None, <laughs> none. Um, listen, the, um, the, the events of the last few weeks have been quite significant because what we've been looking at, of course, is whether or not there's going to be any kind of hearing in the Congress that examines the allegations of David Grush, the Pentagon whistleblower. And it is starting to look like there is going to be, at the very least, first hearings before the House Oversight Committee of the Defence Department's Inspector General and the Intelligence Community Inspector General. And it's the ICIG that I'm most excited about because Thomas Monheim, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, can soon put to rest in such a hearing the issue of exactly what it was that convinced him that David Grush's allegations or complaints were credible and urgent. And if he's asked the right questions by the Oversight Committee, I think we'll get some very interesting answers. Hopefully, it will soon put an end to the idle speculation from a lot of debunkers and skeptics suggesting that Mr. Grush's complaints were confined solely to his reprisal complaint. It was, in fact, referring to the broader issue of whether or not there is a legacy crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. But I'm not holding my breath, Bryce, that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community is going to make any kind of public admission anytime soon. Well, just so everyone understands, during the Grush testimony, he referred many times to like, well, if you can just get a skiff, which again, I'll probably butcher it. Secure, compartmented information. Facility. Sensitive. Sen S sensitive. Sensitive, compartmented information facility, I think. I don't know why I keep doing that. Anyway, uh, he kept I have saying, I, yeah, I know. He kept saying, I'd like to take this uh, behind closed doors so we can uh, talk about this classified material. And of course, Burchett and others have been saying, you know, let's let's get this uh, these people talking where they can actually tell us what's going on. And it looks like they got their wish. So, uh, again, uh, when we talk about IG, we're talking about inspector general. So there's actually two of these, as you've just pointed out. One of them is the inspector general for the Department of Defense. And the other is the inspector general for the intelligence community. Why are there so many inspector generals, by the way? It's all part of what you Americans do really well, which is accountability, holding your government to account, holding the executive's feet to the fire. And of course, on the UFO UAP issue, this is especially crucial because it's fundamental to David Grush's allegations that there has been a lamentable failure by the Congress to do the proper accountability checks and controls over a very secret special access program that's kept been kept covert for much of the last 70 to 80 years, which has essentially run an illegal reverse engineering crash retrieval program inside the US government and in collaboration with private US aerospace companies. I mean, if this allegation is true, Bryce, and I keep on saying this and I feel like a scratchy record, what we're looking at here is criminal, illegal conduct by government officials, which has been covered up lied about to Congress. People have committed perjury under oath. It's very hard to see how, unless there's some kind of amnesty or truth and reconciliation commission where people are indemnified from ad admitting that they've committed crimes, it's very hard to see if this does come out, if it does come out, it's very hard to see how people won't be sent to jail. Well, that would, well, that'd be news. That would be very interesting. We do know that, um, 
uh, David Grush has been talking about this for a long time since we saw him here in Los Angeles, then, uh, of course, through the, the hearings. So he's finally going to get his chance. He said he has the names and dates and locations and all of this. There's nothing stopping him if he's in a skiff with legitimate members of Congress from telling them what he knows. So I look forward to that. The question that people are still going to be asking, though, is, all right, that's great. Grush and, and company, uh, the people who are coming behind him, end up in one of these skiffs where they can tell their stories. What then happens? Uh, I would hate to think that they get to tell Congress uh, what they know that has, as you mentioned, been kept secret for 70, 80, 90 years, and then Congress gets to keep it secret for a while. Um, I still am a, a, a little ticked off at the charade that's going on, because I know one of the things that we're going to talk about is there's a new report from Arrow, um, which is the Pentagon program looking into this. And that report, of course, has some stuff in it. And, and it talks about all the many and varied sightings that have happened uh, since their last report. And at the end of the day, I still get ticked off because I'm sitting here in my office with 200 UFO books. I'm sure you've got a collection like it. And so do many of our listeners and viewers. And those books name dates and places and, and, and sightings that are so voluminous that I would think a report should sort of categorize all of that. Now, I know that they talk about that in some of the legislation, but I haven't seen anything that just plain up says, yes, there are these unidentified things. Let us tell you about the top 50 sightings of the past few decades. That's what I want to see because I'm tired of this charade. I'm just ticked off. Well, I think you? you're going to see what you're asking for because there is a report that's required by congressional legislation to be coming down, I think, in January or February next year. I think it's to the House Armed Services Committee, and they've demanded a report on essentially all UFO sightings, I think, in the last 20 years. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure somebody will. But the um, it's meant to be a very thorough analysis of all UAP sightings and an attempt to at least hold their feet to the fire for stuff that's been within recent modern history. But I think also, um, it's, this is a good segue, Bryce, to yeah. uh, one of the big events of the last few weeks, which, of course, is the big yawn, the uh, the Arrow report, the report of the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, the Pentagon's UAP office. They've brought down their annual report for financial year 2023 into the phenomena. And frankly, uh, not a lot happened, if you believe Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. And um, I, I think what really, to me, says most is the you couldn't get more obvious an attempt by the supposed office investigating Pentagon UAP issues, an attempt to try and play down and dissimulate about what really has been going on. Um, uh, essentially, yes, it acknowledges that there's been more than 270 reports of UAPs reported to the US government in the past eight months, many of them made by the military and commercial pilots. Um, but essentially, um, Sean Kirkpatrick uh, yet again did a preemptive interview with um, a tame network, CNN, and he told them that he had no evidence that's, that there's any suggestion of anything extraterrestrial in mm. nature. And he encouraged anyone who might have such information to contact his team. Well, frankly, Bryce, let's call it out for what, what it is. That's just a completely misleading and disingenuous assertion by Dr. Kirkpatrick. I know for a fact that David Grush, prior to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick's appointment to RO, gave him an extensive briefing about what David Grush had uncovered, including the sort of detail that would be given in private skiffs. Moreover, there are countless witnesses, dozens of witnesses who have come forward, some of whom have gone to Arrow against their better judgment, and quite clearly the attempt by Dr. Kirkpatrick to play down the significance of what they've told him and his staff um, is very telling, because frankly, if that's the assertion of Dr. Kirkpatrick, that there's nothing anomalous essentially in what he's being told by these people, I'm sorry, let's call it out for what it is. It's not the case at all. Uh, well, I'm talking to some of those people. They're assuring me that they have provided very detailed evidence to Arrow, 
and they're frustrated that their evidence is not being taken seriously. Now, that is a major worry. Why, why is the Pentagon keeping a person in charge of their UAP office who is, I believe, actively trying to play down and uh, underemphasize the significance of what he's being told by confidential witnesses? Well, as we've been predicting for a while now, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick isn't long in this job, which is interesting because if we keep predicting it every uh, episode here, we're eventually going to be right. But I do hear that he is uh, on a limited uh, string here. Uh, I've read uh, this report, uh, although it took me several days because I kept trying to read it as I was falling asleep and I fell asleep too quickly. But it's not terrible in that I'm going to just take the two things that you just said, Ross, that I think are kind of intriguing because they're they're listed sort of matter-of-factly, which is, as you just said, more than 270 reports of unidentified anomalous phenomena taken place in the last eight months that were mostly reported by members of the military and commercial pilots. Okay, let me put it this way. We have been living in a world where since 1969, the government was telling us until 2017, we don't even look at UFO reports. Well, they obviously did. And now they're at least telling us in a somewhat transparent way that they're getting a lot of reports. And remember, um, these are high quality reports. These are uh, pilots and, and they usually know what they're talking about. We, we trust them to get in billion dollar aircraft. They better do it right. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Now, I am kind of curious though, because you, you do talk to a lot of people. You're talking to anybody saying that Sean... Uh, is not long for this arrow world of his? There is a lot of speculation. I mean, I, look, I'm told Dr. Kirkpatrick is a very respected scientist. Um, and uh, I don't know the truth, for example, of Matt Ford's claims on the Good Trouble show that um, were reported in the last 24 hours, where, where Matt's basically alleged that there is some kind of alleged secret committee of um, including gatekeepers to the legacy program that is essentially advising Dr. Kirkpatrick um, in RO on, um, on what to do and where to go. But um, what I can tell you is there are a lot of people who don't think he's doing a very good job. And there's a huge disappointment from witnesses uh, who say that they've gone forward to Arrow and they believe that their representations to Arrow are being unfairly downplayed and ignored. And uh, moreover, there are a larger number of witnesses who've come forward to the Congress and to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community uh, with evidence that frankly hasn't gone to Arrow because they don't trust Arrow. So the, the big question, my friend, is basically what's going to happen if the Pentagon's going to continue with this farce where they've got an acknowledged debunker uh, actively going out to try and um, frankly mislead the public on the reality of what's going on with witnesses coming forward with evidence of alleged anomalous issues, objects in our skies and in other, in other arenas, then frankly, um, why are they in the job? I noticed, for example, Chris Mellons, just in the last few hours, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence, has made the note that uh, the report states that none of the 291 cases considered by Arrow in this financial year were positively attributable to foreign adversaries. And he makes the point that that's a very stunning admission because you can't help but wonder about the Navy cases involving brightly lit objects that were seen and recorded just off the coast of California. Um, Mellon basically says he understands they have continued harassing and buzzing Navy ships, and that's my understanding as well. And an explanation has not been found for those perplexing cases. Um, as Mellon says, this consistent lack of evidence connecting any UAP cases to foreign nations strengthens the ET hypothesis for the small number of unsolved cases involving extreme velocities and or mythologies. Now, I think that's a very valid point. I do too. And I know that one of the things that we've been doing on our show is um, toward the end, we talk, we're, we've been walking our way through the various years. We started with, uh, I believe, 45 and, and uh, Foo Fighters and 46 and Ghost Rockets and 47 and Roswell. And we're up to 48 uh, this year or this show. And I'll tell you what I've been doing is I've got some 
great books. I love Richard Dolan's book, UFOs in the National Security State. And I love this book, UFOs in the Government, a Historical Inquiry uh, by a collection of people, but mostly Michael Swords and Robert Bell. And the thing is, as I was doing a little research for the, the 48 section to come, what I was just struck by is just the sheer volume of things where they're unidentified and they're doing things that no one can figure out how they do them. And there are reports uh, aplenty being written uh, in 48 because the, the reports started coming in after the very hyper 47. And these reports are, are were classified originally and then they got released from Freedom of Information Act. And these reports over and over are saying, these are unknown, and uh, we don't uh, we don't really have a good explanation for them. And they're sort of keeping the door open a little bit to what was always assumed to be ET back then. Uh, now, of course, uh, the the ball has moved down the field, and now people call it uh, NHI, non human intelligence, uh, which may mean again, if you have to switch from talking about ET to NHI, to me that always feels like well, you must know something for you to make that big a distinction. So. I just keep looking at all of this detail. And again, I want to just assure anyone who's listening to us, we're not talking about a dozen cases or 270. We're talking, if you go back to the 40s, uh, we're talking about many, many, many thousands of cases all over the world, all of which are mysterious, uh, very few of which were ever attributed to anybody else's technology uh, on here on Earth, not to Russia or China or Germany or anybody not, or, or us. So this delay, this game, this charade, whatever you want to call it, folks, continues to this day. And the thing that is most irritating, of course, is that they're betting that most people don't know anything about this. They're still betting that if they just make it look like, hey, we're just trying to get the data in on these most recent ones, um, that's just a big fraudulent trick because the data has been coming in and we should be talking about it. So I just wanted to say, Ross, when you were talking about that report that is supposed to tell us a historical review, since that's kind of my horse I ride all the time. I'm very interested in reading that one. I want to see if there's an honest appraisal of these last seven, eight, nine decades and whether they're really going to start telling us. And then a final thing on my, my, you know, rant here is we know for a fact that there are better photos and better videos that have been taken by the military over the years or by commercial pilots and taken away from them. Where did those photos and film and video go? And why aren't we seeing some of it? Are they telling us that after all these decades, there's not one single picture of a craft that looks like NHI that they can not, that they can release, and yet they can release images of China and Russia trying to bump our jets in the air, but we can't release one of those that doesn't have to reveal sources and methods of anything that could simply reveal, yes, this is what one of them looks like. I mean, I just don't buy it anymore, Ross. And I, I don't want to sound like the, the angry man who just can't be satisfied, but I feel like that now. I just feel like every official document that comes out is prevaricating. It is trying to get out of the way of just an essential confirmation, and it could all be solved. We could end the first part of this debate tomorrow by simply having Congress or the Pentagon or someone put out a single film or video or photo from those past cases, and then we have an entirely different conversation. So until they do that, I'm going to be a, a very deep skeptic of this process. I, I, look, I completely agree with you, but the, the interesting thing is um, I don't think there is a willingness to reveal this to the public. I mean, I think there's long been an assumption in the UFO, UAP social media community that at some stage, Joe Biden's going to walk up to a lectern and, and <laughs> frankly, yeah. make an admission of a non-human no. intelligence. I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. And to give you an example, just remember after the February shoot downs, the weird incidents, which, which still, frankly, remain unexplained, and which, by the way, I've been investigating for News Nation. Um, 
just after those shootdowns, you'll remember that um, uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, made a very dramatic announcement that the president was going to create a, a committee, some kind of council or committee to in investigate the phenomenon. Now, I'm told, quietly, that's been shut down. Uh, but what's interesting is I'm told also the White House has been involved very, very closely in uh, advising and assisting in the crafting of what's called the Schumer Amendment, which is the amendment crafted by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, which is still only proposed legislation, but due to come before the House in coming weeks and hopefully passing into law in the National Defence Authorization Act. And I know I've said in previous months that the um, it's beginning to look a lot more pessimistic that the Schumer Amendment will pass the House. I'm told there are going to be amendments to the law, possibly in the area of the eminent domain, the confiscation of uh, non-human intelligence technology materials. Um, there might be some adjustment made in that to adjust the simple fact that if you're a corporate aerospace company and you've been spending your company's hard-earned dime on recovering material, why the hell should the taxpayer be able to recover this? I can I can actually sympathise with them on that. Um, I do think the government should be told about it, though, and I think that's what the amendment will try and address. But I can tell you, Bryce, one glimmer of good news, one optimistic ray of hope in the otherwise sordid swamp of misery uh, relating to the UAP disclosure field is the um, is the probability now that I think it's more likely than not that the Schumer Amendment will pass into law in the National Defence Authorisation Act and that we will go into next year with a presidential records review panel for UAPs. This nine-member review panel will be set up and there will be a process over about six months. We're probably round about by this time next year, which, oh, just by the way, happens to be a US election. Um, there will be a presidential report sitting on the, the president's desk, whoever that happens to be at the time, um, making a decision about whether or not this material should be released. And I think this has all been very structured. I think the timing is all very deliberate because let's assume that Joe Biden's still president in, say, November next year when the presidential mm -hmm. records review panel's report on UAPs comes into the White House Oval Office. If I was Joe, I'd basically think to myself, this is more trouble than it's worth for a presidential election campaign. I'm going to put this one on the back burner for a few months until the incumbent replacement president, that sure as hell won't be Joe Biden, comes into power. Um, and then I think we'll start seeing some serious reforms. I think this all has been very cleverly structured by the White House. What we have to do is we have to look at what's really been going on in Congress, because as you rightly say, Bryce, I think we're entitled to be sceptical about whether there is any genuine intention by Congress to release material into the public domain. And I know, frankly, I just know for a fact that inside private aerospace, they've been having conniptions about the probability that, that their material, as they see it, their non-human intelligence technology that it will be forcibly disclosed not only to the Congress, but to the knowledge of the rest of the world. And there's a massive pushback happening at lobbying level. Uh, various flunkies from different lobbying firms are going around on behalf of very senior and well-known aerospace companies twisting congressional arms, impressing upon them that, uh, okay, maybe Congress can be briefed on this, but why the hell should the public know? And I think this is where the UAP social media community needs to pull its socks up. It needs to stop shafting itself, um, yeah. bitterly, rancorously dividing itself with sniping and infighting, and it needs to develop a more concerted approach to actually making sure there's a unanimity of opinion about whether or not the public should be told this stuff. Because I do think there is a serious risk that whatever the presidential records review panel tells the president around about this time next year, there is a serious risk that you and I, Joe Public, will be snowed. I, I think there's a very good chance of that. Let me unpack some of this stuff. Um, first of all, by the way, 
uh, it, this uh, report you're working on for News Nation. Please, after you've reported it, come back and expound on it here. We should definitely uh, talk about that one. But, you know, the thing that f uh, I really kind of winced at when you said the phrase, they think it's their material, and you were talking about uh, private aerospace. I mean, boy, that's pretty cheeky on their part to talk to for them to think that something that proves the the biggest question that we have right now, which is, are we alone in the universe? And they have evidence that that speaks to that, and they think it's theirs. First of all, it's ours. Okay, we paid for the pickup as citizens and uh, taxpayers. And as citizens of planet Earth, we, it's certainly ours. So I don't buy that for a second. Forgive me, and, forgive me for yeah. interrupting just for one yeah. moment. I, 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 I've spoken to somebody in private aerospace, actually multiple okay. people in private aerospace. And whilst we're all dancing a gentle dance uh, with uh, people being evasive about just what they have, um, I'm told that there have been retrievals and that they've been paid for solely by private aerospace companies. So let's say you're a private aerospace yeah. company and you've recovered a piece of non-human technology. Let's just assume hypothetically for okay. a moment that's true. Why the hell should the government be able to exercise eminent domain ownership over that technology? I appreciate we should be told and the public should be told we have the right to know whether or not we are alone in this universe. And I know the government knows well, that. Um, I, 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 I mean, I take your point, but either either we control the government and it works for us or it doesn't. And if the government works for us, uh, I'm in favor as a citizen of demanding that the government go to private aerospace. I don't care if they did pay for the retrieval. This goes beyond a simple case of, hey, it's mine. I went out and dug it up and now I own it and I don't have to tell anybody about it. And the problem is, of course, the people we're looking to fix this problem are in government, and the government has been a large part of the problem, most of the problem, for most of the time. So, the you know, the idea that the Pentagon wants to get this material either back from private enterprise uh, and aerospace or uh, just get it in the first place, their history seems to state that they'll just hide it again. So I'm not down with that. And and I do feel like um, there's a lot of us in the sort of the UFO research community who ha are being trained to accept crumbs from people. And it's time for us to say, no effing way, not anymore. Uh, you've got it. Uh, somebody's got it. Let's talk about it. Let's prove it. Let's, let's put it up there. Um, and because this thing that's frustrating me is Dave Grush, who obviously knows what he's talking about, and these other 30 or so whistleblowers <coughs> behind him, excuse me, they keep saying of Dave Grush, well, where's his proof? As if Dave Grush was supposed to walk out of the Pentagon with a piece of a, of a spacecraft. Well, that's not the way it works. But the truth of the matter is, if you read up on this topic, you know damn well that uh, civilian uh, researchers don't have the proof because we didn't get it in the first place. The people who got it were either the military or, as you point out, private aerospace, who immediately, in the case of the government, classified it. In the case of uh, private aerospace, hid it in their own, you know, back warehouses. And we're all left out in the dark. And it is not cool anymore. And I think incredibly... Uh, uh, more people every day are waking up to that fact and saying, "I don't get it." If there's if there's proof that we're not alone, why don't why don't we at least start talking about that? Because that's the thing that's bothering me. I guess if I try to get Ross to the thing that really is ticking me off, it's that we're su we're supposed to prove our own case, but we can't get at the very things that would prove it, and the people who have it won't do it, and it's just freaking unacceptable. Then the other thing finally is um, this presidential research, uh, you know, the um, the panel that's being put together. Do we know of anyone who's actually on it yet? I mean, I haven't seen or heard anything. No, they, about they, they haven't, they haven't, uh, they haven't composed the panel yet. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm talking to people who have been approached uh, and there are people being approached and discussed about whether or not they would be willing to be involved. And um, if some of the people that I know about um, are involved, then 
I'm really happy. Uh, it's yeah. good. Well, it represents. Well, that's good. You should be on it, but you're not an American it, it, citizen, it does so you can't. It. If, if, say if again. They do, it, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, if they do go ahead with the um, the names that I'm aware of, it would be very, very positive because they're right. honourable, decent people who I'm pretty sure would not put up with a cover up. And, are these uh, people um, that you're referring to names that you can divulge, or are you no, are you saying that they're no. just being suggested by by whom? Who is suggesting well, these? Basically, I mean, I don't think people realise that when Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, came up with that legislation, he didn't conceive it by himself. There have been very active negotiations ongoing between very senior people in the Congress, including Schumer, and the White House at National Security Council level. And I'm told Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has been very heavily involved in consulting on this, as have been certain people, uh, perhaps former presidents, who've been consulting on this as well. There is a determination on the Democrat side that this is an issue that is not going to be allowed to be buried yet again. The big issue that I want to emphasize, though, is the risk that Joe Biden is going to be distracted, not just by the possible imminent threat of a Middle Eastern war, a massive right. conflagration that sucks up most of the world, but also by the fact that, I mean, I don't want to speak ill, but having seen Joe Biden's performance on television in recent weeks, I really do question whether he's going to make it to the next election in terms of being able to present as a, a, a president who is actually capable of stringing a sentence together. There was one particularly incomprehensible exchange which he had with reporters on board Air Force One. And you kind of wonder, my God, this man is the leader nominally of the free world right now. He, he is not presenting well. And I mean, the implications are enormous if Joe Biden doesn't make it through to the next election for any reason, if he has to step aside. I suppose theoretically Kamala Harris takes over. But um, what happens? Really, does, well, what happens? What happens to the UAP legislation? What happens to the hopes that there might be disclosure in 2024? Um, I am worried. That's my biggest worry right now, that we might be pushed off the front page by more serious and grave developments in the Middle East. Well, we will be pushed off the off the front page, uh, but that doesn't mean that things can't be going on behind the scenes. And I look forward to you know seeing some of that happen. As for you know Biden's fitness for office, I'm going to let Republicans and Democrats fight their way through that one because I know if I express any opinion whatsoever, like you just did, I'm going to let you get the hate mail this time, and I'm going to try to avoid it myself by just saying. In the room. I mean, I, this is the thing I don't understand about America is like nobody's talking about it, but. But oh, I'm they really are. Different. Oh, my I'm, God. Ross, welcome. You, I, I invite you to get on that jet again and come over here to L.A. and we'll sit in my uh, viewing uh, area and we'll watch news for, for a day. You'll see people continue to talk about it. But I think you're right, though, just from a, a real politic point of view, what's going on in the Middle East uh, it definitely takes priority. I mean, you've got a potential world conflagration and that's going to uh, organize most people's thoughts around it. But there is also that point of view. And I, I realize I may share it and you may share it, but we don't know who actually shares this in Washington. But the idea that we should uh, maybe think about the fact that the the confirmation, if you will, of the fact that we're not alone is a good Hail Mary in a time of near war everywhere. Uh, because uh, it will at least have us realize it isn't the, the the war amongst ourselves we should be paying attention to, but the war of the worlds, if you will. Um, and I'm not saying, by the way, that whoever these NHIs are are, are completely negative or, or anything like that, but we don't know because people aren't sharing uh, enough. And I think that is incredibly too bad. So just by the way, just because we like to keep track of such things, uh, I try to listen for people who are running for president to see who will talk about this. And remember the last fail first, the first failure that I noted was RFK Jr. Didn't know how to talk about the topic at all and seemed to know nothing about it. Maybe he's brought his game up since then. And Chris Christie turned it all into a joke at the Republican debate. And to be honest with you, I haven't heard anybody else talking about it. Have, have you heard any candidate recently venture a, a comment? No, and that's not a good thing. It's not a good no. thing. 
Um, I, I know crazy. Lou Elizondo keeps on hinting that there's going to be dramatic revelations early in 2024. Um, uh, I, I can only hope that that's first-hand witnesses coming forward. Um, I don't think it is, though. Um, uh, but look, I, I'm optimistic purely and simply because it is significant that you're going to have the DOG Inspector General giving evidence uh, for the House Oversight Committee on the 26th of October, which is in two days from when we're recording this. And the Intelligence Community Inspector General will be testifying on November the 16th, uh, which interestingly enough is one day before the Seoul Foundation, the UAP uh, disclosure group, the private UAP disclosure group's first annual general meeting in San Francisco. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, these two incidents where inspectors general are basically compelled to give evidence before a congressional committee, uh, I'm hoping something leaks from those hearings because um, it's very hard to see how they couldn't be required to give evidence that will either dispute or confirm the allegations of David Grush. Sure, something might leak, but again, I can just hear the chattering classes going, well, where's the proof? I mean, he said this and he said that and that leaked, but short of showing me a picture or a film or something, people are still going to keep saying, where's the proof? Where's the beef here? Yeah, I, no, I don't know. It's, it's, and, and, and they're in good company because I noticed um, Ohio Congressman Mike Turner, who, of course, is not conflicted in any way, even though he's received a couple of hundred thousand dollars from the aerospace community. He said this would take thousands and thousands of people for such an unbelievable cover up to be occurring. That's, of course, if what David Grush is saying <laughs> is true. And for people to speak with such confidence, he says, over something they do not know is, I think, something certainly everybody needs to be concerned about. So, well, frankly, people, you should all go back to your homes and stop worrying because Ohio Congressman Mike Turner has reassured you there's absolutely nothing to it. And he's not conflicted in the slightest by the coin he receives from the aerospace community. Put not your mind not only in- that, he is the congressman where... Uh, Wright Patterson is where Project Absolutely. Blue Book was. As we've said, I have this to say again for the congressman, Mike Turner. Why don't you pick up a copy of this or have your office pick it up and go through it and then tell me there's nothing to this whole thing? Uh, the government itself has been, it, it's, it hasn't been particularly open with the people in a one on one, but it's been open within its own, uh, you know, work place talking about this thing for for many decades and we're only just now sort of reaching that point where we can all talk about it ourselves just one other quick thought though i can't let you just uh, uh trash joe biden we also need to trash the leading republican uh member who's re- who probably going to be the republican nominee for president trump because he hasn't you know he was in office too just like uh biden he had a chance to make a significant uh step forward and he didn't uh he had to be chased down in the oval office by george stephanopoulos and then he he never or his son in an interview he hasn't hasn't really been forthright about this and of course biden has neither uh for whatever reason uh these two men who have both been in the Oval Office and and probably know a great deal, at least know that this is a real phenomenon that deserves to be taken uh, seriously. They've chosen not to take it seriously in a public way. And I, I think that is is not good. I wish we had other uh, candidates who were had more open minds toward this thing. And, and whether we get it or not, I, I couldn't tell you right now. But um, we... Uh, I think it's pretty clear to me, Russ, that the next term of whoever is the next president, whether it's Biden or or Trump or one of the Republican challengers or RFK Jr., I don't care who, uh, whoever gets that job next, they're going to be the disclosure president, whether they want to be or not. Now, I know I we've right. talked about, yeah, we, we've talked about how, well, I don't know, people are trying to put this toothpaste back in the tube. I'm not seeing it. I, I mean, I do see that 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 intent is there, but I don't think we've ever, uh, in in my reading, ever seen Congress uh, awake a, a enough about this. So, uh, as they are now, uh, at least some of them, not all of them. You got your Turners out there, but you also got the others who want to talk about it, 
And uh, that's all it's going to take, because as you, you mentioned, there's a whole coalition of things that are going to happen. There's going to be leaks. And I hope some of those leaks include pictures. And wouldn't that be a joy? Now, Bryce, I'm conscious of time because I also yeah. want to get you to talk about 1948 because it's the 75th anniversary of a very auspicious year in UAPs. But before we get to that, I, yeah. I wanted to talk about the very interesting interview that James Lekatsky, uh, oh, yes. the DI, former right. DIA scientist, did with our friends uh, Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp on their Weaponized podcast. And um, there's one thing in particular that Lekatsky alleged uh, and the book alleges, it says that at the conclusion of a 2011 meeting in the Capitol building with a U.S. senator and an agency undersecretary, James Lekatsky, the only one of the book's authors, posed a question. He stated the U.S. was in possession of a craft of unknown origin and had successfully gained access to its interior. Quote, this craft had a streamlined configuration suitable for aerodynamic flight, but no intakes, exhaust, wings, or control surfaces. In fact, it appeared not to have an engine, fuel tanks, or fuel. Lekatsky asked, what was the purpose of this craft? Was it a life support craft useful only for atmospheric reentry, or what? If it was a spacecraft, then how did it operate? And then George Knapp asked the question, he, he asked that question and, and basically Lekatsky asked him, replied, sorry, what's in the book is an exact statement of the event that occurred in a congressional facility. And crucially, Lekatsky confirmed that he'd been authorized to say this um, in a government DOPSA, the Defense Office Pre-Publication Security Review Approval. So now you've got, this is very significant and it's worth putting it on the record because you've now got David Grush, You've got Chris Mellon, uh, and you've got others, but now you've got James Lekatsky, a former DIA scientist, basically making the flat allegation that the United States has recovered non-human intelligence technology. And moreover, it's gained access to it, and clearly it has no bloody idea how it all works. Now, I think that's very significant. It's worth putting it on the record. And again, I just find it hilarious that... Um, uh, you know, you can you can have a, a reputable scientist like James Lekatsky saying that, and everybody in Congress just politely goes, "Oh yes, let's move on." Now. Yes, thanks very much. <laughs> I just find it isn't it? Amazing. it? It makes you crazy. I mean, look, here's the thing. I saw that same. Um, uh, I saw our friend's uh, weaponized podcast, and um, if Grush is saying too much beyond what he was supposed to say, I mean, it seems to me there's been a lot of concern. What what was he told he could actually say? And did he go a little bit over the line or whatever? That's the opposite of Lukatsky. I mean, I found that interview on Weaponized to be, I, I guess, frustrating. Uh, Lukatsky, even though he did say that some of the things that you said there, he was also saying too little. He, was, he came across as smug and arrogant and uh, I'm just not going to level with you uh, because I'm not, I guess, because he's not supposed to, but it didn't play very well to me. Um, I, but I do take, uh, I, I believe it was Jeremy, Jeremy Corbell, that sort of said, but have you yourself been inside one of these things? And of course, he said, well, my dop, uh, the dops, uh, you know, didn't um, allow me to answer that question. Um, but he had a little bit of a smile on his face when he denied it. So who knows? Yeah, he also took a few swipes at David Grush on the way through as well. He did. Uh, I mean, he, he said he considered David Grush credible and that his statements were reasonable, but he wouldn't answer any questions about potentially biological remains that have been recovered right. from craft of supposedly non-human origin. And then he was talking about some of the witnesses, without naming them, interviewed by David Grush, and he said, and this is poisonous, and I know I know there's going to be a response from David Grush at some stage. He said, you can't call them liars. They totally believe it now. How many of those people that David Grush, Grush came across fit in that category? I could name a list of them right now, but I won't. I mean, obviously, I respect their opinions, but I know what they're saying is false. I, now, I, was, I was disappointed that there was no attempt yeah. to pin Jim Lekatsky further down on what he was saying there, because essentially he was slurring a lot of very brave people who've come forward to the Congress, to the inspectors general, and also to Arrow, fat chance of them getting heard there. But the, the fact is these people have risked their careers, if not their lives, in making the decision to come forward. 
Frankly, I do not think we should be belittling them or calling them liars. And I would like to hear the evidence, frankly, that makes any basis for the assertion that what they're saying is false. Because I know those claims made by Jim Lekatsky are going to be very aggressively and very, very vigorously disputed, and evidence will be provided. Yeah, I, you and I had discussed maybe having uh, the the team, the Lekatsky team, uh, on our show to to talk to him, and I was put off of that by watching Weaponize because I thought he's not going to say anything more. He's got his talking points down. He's decided how far he's going to go, and that's it. Um, I know we we need to move on a little bit. One thing I did want to highlight is, um, in terms of things that have happened since our last uh, episode, the Spielberg uh, series Encounters has debuted on Netflix. Here, I don't know if it's also. Uh, on at the same time in Australia, I think it is. I think you guys have seen it. Yeah, I've watched um, it. It's, I, yeah. I, I was I liked the first one, but I thought the rest were frankly a bit underwhelming. You know, it's interesting. You and I had that conversation, and the first thing I said was the same thing you just said. So last night, I said to myself, "I better give it another shot. I better watch a few more of them because it's been a month, and maybe I'm just in a was in a bad mood or whatever." So I looked at them again. Um, I think they're very similar in some respects to the uh, series uh, called, I think it was just called UFO by uh, the, the documentary series done on Showtime by J.J. Oh, Abrams. J. J. Abrams. Yeah. And, and I think they both had kind of the same problem. There was a lot of good there. And I, I will say that the one thing that both of them did, but particularly Encounters, is they tried to normalize that very aberrant uh anomalous things, not just craft, but behavior uh, uh, goes along with the phenomenon. And they tried to normalize it by letting us see a lot of uh, reasonable citizens, uh, not just the officials and not just the pilots, but citizens who look like the last thing they would ever do is tell a tall story that didn't exist. So I did think it was good in that regard. And the But the one thing that I found both of them did that was a little irritating is I guess maybe they were trying to say, okay, this is journalism. So if we have someone saying something uh, was real, we better have somebody saying something wasn't real. Sort of uh, the the network thing I always call it, which is some say yes, some say no, we say maybe, right? And I think they were guilty of that, but even worse than in a, like a network report or something, because they gave a lot of time to some just crazy people who yeah, were you the, mean that strange the, bloke from the Ariel, the Ariel yeah, school store? And these yeah. were not people, but the crazy people in these documentaries, Ross, were not the people that saw something. The crazy people. I know. Well, that, that, that like really the ones that about that guy from the Ariel documentary is yeah. if you are going to show journalistic balance, because yeah. they don't have reporters in these stories, I think that guy should have been questioned. And because they don't use a reporter, they, they go with a reporterless documentary. He should have been asked or asked to respond to the notion that previously he'd, tell, he'd said he did see the craft. So yeah. the guy in the Ariel school story, I think it was the number three story in the series of encounters, um, he, he basically poo-pooed the whole Ariel school story and basically said he'd made it up. And so I think the question should be, why should we believe you now if you're admitting that you've lied previously? Right. So. Frankly, to give such credence and such airtime to that guy was, I think, a very bad decision. And lots of airtime. Um, you know, this both sidesism is what sort of did them in. Anyway, I, I I believe that there'll be more and more of these things. Hopefully, you and I will make a few of them. Uh, right, I say we'll take you back seventy five years. I, yeah. I know we've got limited time, and I All really right, okay. love. Your All this. right, let's do this. Take All right, seventy five years. years. Okay, as we said at the beginning, we're trying to march through the history of UFOs uh, just enough to, to tweak your interest so that if you want to know more, you're going to go look into it. So we, we've we gone from 45 to 46 to 47. And 48, I think, is a banner year for the UFO issue because 47 is where not only were, were the citizens of the world kind of taken by surprise by this whole thing. There was that big summer of the saucers and, and uh, there was Roswell and, and, and uh, there was the uh, twining memo and all that stuff that we talked about in our last episode. But in 1948, man, it was just rocking with great cases because, and, and some reports, because what was happening is while the people may have been sort of 
coming back down off the the sugar high of 1947 uh, and all those sightings, the government was getting into it. And whoever these pilots of these craft were, were definitely not going away. Let me just give a couple of highlights and Ross, I want you to sort of respond to them, but like, okay, Project Sign uh, got set up and running in the first half of that year, and it became Project Grudge, which was a little less about finding the truth and a little more about covering it up uh, by the end of the year. It was also the time, uh, 1948, where the estimate of the situation uh, was written. Uh, this report made it all the way up to the top and then got slapped back down because it suggested that they were probably extraterrestrial. And the person who said that was someone who read the report, uh, Ruppelt, who ran uh, Project Blue Book. Um, also in 1948, uh, Colonel Robert Landry started briefing Harry Truman at his request on UFOs and for the next four and a half years, I believe every three months, he came in and gave the president his assessment. Also on cases, and again, I'm just hitting the highlights and none of the details. I hope people can, uh, those two books I showed you at the beginning would be great sources, but Thomas, uh, Captain Thomas Mantell was the first person to uh, at least look like he died while chasing a UFO. That happened in uh, the summer of 48. And... Um, uh, uh, Thomas Gorman, I believe, was the first person, uh, a pilot who got in a dogfight in Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Uh, it was also the time of that Eastern Airlines uh, sighting with Childs and Witted, which was amazing. Uh, missile tractors, trackers rather saw all kinds of UFOs dancing above them at, at White Sands. U.S. and Canadian forces at Goose Bay up in Canada saw quite a show. Um, and 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 frankly, in uh, Japan, they they saw uh, UFOs that went from 200 miles per hour to 12 1,200 miles per hour, just like that. Um, and um, we also got just to wrap that up the first simultaneous visual sighting and radar confirmation case at Furton, I believe, Felbrek uh, Air Force Base in Munich. Um, and we also had the green fireballs in Los Alamos. And uh, Netherlands ended up seeing a classic cigar-shaped wingless craft with two sets of windows. And I always have to say, Ross, I'm going to turn you loose on this, but what's up with the two sets of windows? That crops up <laughs> over and over in ufology. And I'm trying to ask myself, first of all, it tells me that whatever those craft are, are not the craft that have traveled light years to get here. They're the craft from someplace else because you don't put windows in a craft unless you want to see something with your own eyes, which tells us whoever's flying these things has eyes or they wouldn't be building two sets of windows. Who's in these two sets of windows? Is it a tourist class? I don't know. It's I, I'm confused. You know, the other case that happened in 1948 is one of my favorite alleged crash retrievals, which I notice Wikipedia pompously asserts was a hoax. And that's the Aztec New Mexico UFO incident. And um, it's been dismissed by Wikipedia as a hoax, and there's all manner of debunkers who've tried to, deb to, to debunk it. But according to um, Frank Scully, uh, in March 1948, there was a craft containing 16 humanoid bodies recovered by the military in New Mexico after making a controlled landing in Hart Canyon, 12 miles northeast of the city of Aztec. And I'm told that case, the Aztec case, is one we should watch because we may be hearing a lot more about it sometime in the next 12 months. Now, Bryce, I'm very conscious of time, but yeah. I think just to make the point about 1948, I just bloody well hope that you and I don't have to wait another 75 oh. years before we get to the detail of what happened in 1948, let alone what happened in 2023. I, I put my glass, I agree with you. I put my glasses on because I want to read something and I'm half blind without them for this. This comes from, uh, at the end of the year, uh, Project Sign released what was called, quote, analysis of flying object incidents in the U.S., and this is one of the things that comes from this document. And remember, this is not a document shared with the American public or the world. This was a document written inside the Pentagon that was shared inside the Pentagon that we got only because of the Freedom of Information Act. But here's what they did say. The frequency of reported sightings, the similarity in many of the characteristics attributed to the observed objects, 
and the quality of observers considered as a whole support considered as a whole support the contention that some type of flying object has been observed and it concludes the origin of the devices is not ascertainable so part of what you're saying i mean that makes me feel good that they were writing about it but it makes me feel bad that there's not much difference between what they said in 1948 and what they've said in these reports that you and I are debating and talking about right now. And I would think any rational person would expect a higher standard of, I mean, of progress. That's not progress. I you mean, know, you know I, was, I was just laughing to myself, Bryce, because I was thinking, oh my God, if we're not careful, we're going to start sounding like those two old blokes from the Muppets. I know. That sit that sit in the orchestra box and basically lament the the quality of the show. I mean, the the simple fact is, yes, we're not happy. We're very very annoyed, and we're not going to wait another seventy five years for answers. Um, I think yeah. we have to call it a day soon, my friend. I think we have to call it a day. I just want to give a quick head up to everybody. Heads up, uh, we've been working on a music video for a song called Need to Know. And while it's not the most important thing that we'll be doing on this show, it is kind of fun. I've got the first edit I'm looking at right now, and uh, it's very good. And uh, we hope to debut it sometime very soon. And in the meantime, Ross, it's been uh, you know a pleasure. And I would just say this. Um, we don't... Um, we, we we don't have a, necessarily a right to know, but we need to know. We just need to know these things that we talk about. And maybe in our own small way, we can help build a consensus among people who haven't given this a lot of thought that maybe it is time to get on the right side of this issue. So sayonara. Sayonara. That's a good place to end. All right. Bye-bye.